Hello and welcome to another adventure here on my channel. Today we're going to be talking about the toxic masculinity of David Dobrik and Shane Dawson because in this past year these two creators have had I would say similar experiences in that they have had long careers here on YouTube, long celebrated careers, and now have really been called out for their past abusive actions that have been going on for a pretty long time that the general YouTube community did not seem to notice. There were some, especially with Shane Dawson, creators calling him out for a long time, but the general community really didn't call out this behavior until this year. And I don't want to focus too much on the what side of things, as in what happened, but rather the how. How did this behavior continue for a long period of time with the majority of people not seeming to notice? All right, Editing Joe here. I decided that I do want to include a little more information about the what of the situation. This will still be just a bit of an overview though. So if you would like more information about this situation, I will have more videos linked down in the description for you to check out. But Shane Dawson and David Dobrik are both similar in that they have had had very celebrated careers here on YouTube for the most part until this past year when both of them got caught up in large scandals. And because of this, people have gone through their past and found a lot more problematic behavior done in plain sight on their channels. So Shane Dawson got caught up in the Dramageddon Part 2 or Carmageddon, whatever it was called, scandal where his involvement in the Bi Sister video came to light and his actions trying to take down James Charles, which more information has come forward about James Charles, which which I will not be addressing in this video, but none of them are particularly innocent in this situation. However, because of this scandal, more information about Shane Dawson's past has come to light, clip after clip of him doing very inappropriate things, of him doing blackface multiple times. Oh, nigga, bitch monkey woman you're the best saying overly sexual things to and about both underage girls and underage boys and even kissing a 12 year old fan okay he would make frequent remarks that he was just going to children he would joke that he is a file he would just say that point blank he would joke that he's not a he would make jokes about collecting child pornography. I have nightmares. What are they about? Mine are always about somebody breaking into my house and taking my computer. But then it always scares me because I'm like, if somebody stole my computer, you know how much blackmail they would have on me? I mean, the fact that I haven't been on to catch a predator yet is like a miracle. All right, now it's time to see some hot, sexy bitches wearing my Hot Topic shirts. Damn. Oh, if I Justine wasn't watching, I would all of you. I'm gonna fuck him. I'm gonna fuck her. Then I'm gonna fuck him. Then I'm gonna make him react to it. Oh god. Oh, I'll whip your hair back and forth. Oh. oh. Good job, Lucy. But next time, shake your titties more. And you, take off the jacket and show more. And Lucy, I checked my statistics and I have a lot of child watching. So can you please eat a cocktail weenie? Do it slow. <laughs> Oh. Oh, oh, I like that chocolate, that weenie. As well as using his power to influence minors to do sexual things for him, such as twerk on camera for him. I love you too. Can you twerk for us? I know twerking is insane. Oh, I love you too. Oh, I love you too. No, shut up and twerk. Maybe she can't hear us. Okay, okay. Twerk for us. <laughs> he has also continuously implied inappropriate sexual acts with his pets. Can I make out? Oh no, he's obviously ready to have sex with me. I want us to think about having sex with animals at a young age because that fucked me up. Oh yeah, daddy likes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I blinked. All right, you guys, I'm going to go. Muffins is already asleep over there, so I'm going to go join her. And uh, we're going to have a wild cat's. Now, David Dobrik has been caught up in a scandal where his friend, allegedly, a girl, and David Dobrik was an accessory to that crime. 
at least being there at the time of the party and and potentially allowing these underage girls to drink alcohol. And because of this, people dug into his past and brought up him saying the N word. Nigga! Looking at those girls, yeah. So we'll be like, got away with it. He has also made fun of the height of a person with dwarfism. Sick, an empty Lamborghini. Oh, my bad, dog. Fuck off, <laughs> your head into a bunch of melted airheads. <laughs> Finally, I can make fun of something that you weren't born with. <laughs> oh my god, I don't know why this is so adorable. Why have we never thought of this before? <laughs> he is fucking cute. <laughs> Look at that. I can do that all fucking day. Come on back. I want yeah. to. Cards have disappeared. Do you believe it? No. You don't believe it? No. Oh, check him out. Have a look. Have a look at our hands. Oh my god. Taller. <laughs> because, boom. And when that person asked to no longer have those jokes made about him, the so-called friend was removed from David Dobrik's content, pretty much implying that the only reason he was there in the first place was so that these jokes could be made about him and he could be the butt of these jokes. He told it like, dude, I don't want to make these jokes anymore. Hmm. And he was just like, okay, like, that's fine. Like, he was chill about it, whatever. Um, and I knew by saying that I wasn't going to be in the content anymore. It's like, all right, like, I respect that, bro. And then that was that. And it wasn't like... Oh, that um, sounds fucked up. I got to actually interject. You said, yo, I just, I don't want you to make fun of my height anymore. And that was, and he's like, okay, well, there's no point of having you in the vlogs then, right? That was kind of the that doesn't message seem very... that I got. That but, doesn't sound like, very he good. He never to me. vocally said that, you know what I mean? But that was for sure the vibe. He has also made continuous jokes about all of his female friends throughout the past and girlfriends being sluts and whores and teasing them for female sexuality, basically. Hey, baby, you walking or working? Friends. <laughs> your pants. <laughs> because you had too much dick in your ass last night. Corinna, don't smile. You did too. <laughs> Fucking sucking dick underneath the fucking sleigh when I found you. He's asking why I have a big hole in my jersey. So you can show off your tits. It's not that hard to figure out. That's not why I have big holes. Corinna, you had sex with Todd yesterday for the first time? Corinna, just spit it out. Yeah, did he oh, no, she did, she did spit it out. <laughs> <laughs> So that is the situation currently going on. Like I said, there will be more information, more videos down in the description if you would like to know more. But that is a brief overview and brief because there is so much that these two men have done and have just not been called out for until now. Shane Dawson has been called out some in the past, but he's always seemed to bounce back in a way. But this time it is finally in question whether he will bounce back. And David Dobrik doesn't seem to be hurting too bad despite all of this information. So I want to talk about how that is possible, how they have created an environment on their channels where this behavior has been seen as acceptable enough not to be called out by his audience, despite the fact that it is continuous, repeated, terrible behavior. But in this video, I'm going to analyze how they have gotten away with it so long. And my theory is that a lot of it comes down to toxic masculinity, which is a phrase that I want to define and analyze in these contexts. So to start explaining what toxic masculinity actually is. Excuse me. Yes. Wait, you're not Emmy. Who are you? Hello. I'm Society, or Stasi for short, and I'm here today to talk to you about toxic masculinity. Great. Another one. Yes, yes I am. Would you like me to go away? No, no, go ahead. Wonderful. Now, what is toxic masculinity? I'll start by saying what it is not. It is not an attack on masculinity, all things masculine, or men themselves. Toxic masculinity is a bad thing. Masculinity is not. That's why we put the qualifier of toxic there. We don't say racism and toxic racism because we don't need to specify the bad racism. Now that we've talked about what isn't toxic masculinity, let's talk about what toxic masculinity actually is. Now to give a good starting definition of what toxic masculinity actually is, here is a clip from Renegade Cut quoting The Good Men Project. Toxic masculinity is a narrow and repressive description of manhood designating manhood as defined by violence, sex, status, and aggression. It's the cultural ideal of manliness, where strength is everything while emotions are a weakness, where sex and brutality are yardsticks by which men are measured, 
While supposedly feminine traits, which can range from emotional vulnerability to simply not being hypersexual, are the means by which your status as man can be taken away. And I said that was a good starting definition because both in academia and in pop culture, there is a lot of debate and different definitions about what toxic masculinity is. But some researchers agree that there is three core components. One, toughness. This is the notion that men should be physically strong, emotionally callous, and behaviorally aggressive. Two, anti-femininity. This involves the idea that men should reject anything that is considered to be feminine, such as showing emotion or accepting help. And three, power. This is the assumption that men must work towards obtaining power and status, social and financial, so they can gain the respect of others. Now that we have a better understanding of what toxic masculinity is, I'll let Jo continue sharing her theory about how this applies to Shane Dawson and David Dobrik. Oh, um, thank you. That was actually very helpful. You're welcome. I'm happy to assist. Okay, well, now that we have a better understanding of what toxic masculinity actually is and what it is not, I want to apply it to David Dobrik and Shane Dawson because neither of them are what I would at least personally think of as the hyper-masculine, super manly type of person. I don't think most people would call either of them hyper-masculine. Shane Dawson is either gay or bisexual, which tends to go against toxic masculinity. So neither of them really fall into the category that most people would automatically think of as toxic masculinity, hyper-masculine, that stereotypical type that comes to mind when thinking of the phrase. However, there are not toxically masculine men and non-toxically masculine men. It is a spectrum of traits. It is a spectrum of thought. It is a spectrum of things that have been taught to men and women by society as we've all grown up that people internalize to different levels. So every man displays some toxic masculinity and non-toxic masculinity. So just because a man isn't what we typically think of as hyper-masculine, having a lot of those toxic masculinity traits, doesn't mean they cannot display toxic masculinity or are somehow immune to the concept, to the thought process that leads to these traits and actions that can be labeled as toxic masculinity. And since neither of these men really fall into the category that society sees as hyper-masculine, they have probably in their lives experienced backlash in some way for not being hyper-masculine. At least Shane Dawson has talked about being bullied as a child. And to theorize, it probably had to do with not showing these hyper-masculine traits all the time because they are things our society does value. I'm theorizing that they suffered under the same hierarchy that women do that toxic masculinity creates just in a different way and for different reasons. So because neither of these men are hyper-masculine but still exist in a society, exist in a world where hyper-masculinity that really plays into toxic masculinity is very valued, neither of them are immune from it. And they both display a lot of the traits because toxic masculinity in a way is all about power. It is all about hierarchy. It is all about being at the top of the pyramid. And men who have suffered because they are not the hyper-masculine type, I think are more likely to display toxic masculinity if they get a different form of power at a different point in their lives. Especially over women, people of color, and younger men. People lower than them in the social hierarchy that hypermasculinity, patriarchy, and racism creates. And with Shane Dawson and David Dobrik having these huge, huge platforms that they built for themselves, that is a form of power. So you have these men who in the typical masculine hierarchy were not very powerful, now have a different type of social capital and power and have moved up the hierarchy in a way in our society. 
these types of jokes that we've seen them both make over the years about people of color, about women, about people with dwarfism, it was usually towards a person who fell into that category. And that was a way of them exercising power over these people because these people wanted social capital. They wanted clout. They wanted views. And that's what these men could give them. So by exercising this power over the people around them that fell into these categories that were less valued in society and giving them a way to move up if they just allow themselves to be degraded. That is using their power over these people. And again, toxic masculinity has a lot to do with power. And since these people who the jokes were against, who were in these more vulnerable groups, seemed okay with it, they seemed, yeah, it's fine. It's just a joke. He's just my friend, whatever. They seem to okay it for these men's audiences. They now have this taste of power and use it against people who are lower than them in the hierarchy. If you look at their content, both of these people have made content aimed at a younger audience than they are. Again, especially with Shane Dawson, he was making content and aiming it at preteens, middle schoolers, people who are in a very vulnerable position that he could exercise power over and he abused that power. So they both used their newfound power with internet fame and money over the people directly around them to make content for people who were also beneath them in the social hierarchy and influence these children to think these things were okay and that this was a normal thing to do, a normal way to treat people, which again reinforces their own power as white men and degrades these other their groups for the next generation and allows them to continue the people directly around them and in Shane Dawson's case at least his audience his young fan base David Dobrik in the situation while he was not the person who did the crime he was still very complicit in it and actively profited off of it because he was still in a place of power over the over these girls that were in this vlog, he had power to be like, I'm gonna put this on the internet, I'm gonna profit off of it, I'm going to frame it how I want to, I'm going to edit this video and narrate this video and spin this narrative in the way I want to and not include the fact that the was heavily, heavily implicated and could not consent to what was happening. They both used the power that their huge social media platforms afforded them to take advantage of their fans, who in this case were younger women. Which brings us to another aspect of toxic masculinity, anti-femininity. Because both of these men do, I think, at times display some typically feminine traits, which is not a bad thing, even though our society has probably told them in some ways, explicitly and not explicitly in their lives, that these are not good things, that these are not good traits for them to have. So when they have power over someone given by their platform, to younger women who, one, just don't have as much life experience. A 20-something year old has more life experience than 14, 15, 13, 12-year-olds. And in this hierarchy of masculinity, toxic masculinity over femininity, the women are at another disadvantage. They use this power over women, particularly young women, to degrade the feminine and feminine sexuality and took advantage of the power dynamic they purposefully perpetuated. And they framed it all as a joke. They framed this abuse of power and straight up abuse as a joke. They used humor and the typical toxic masculinity excuse, boys will be boys, to exploit their power and create a situation where their victims were fans of and looking up to them and were their friends and working with them. And oh, it's just edgy humor, it's just boys will be boys to take advantage of them and not get called out because they set themselves up as the top of the power structure in their respective worlds. Excuse me again, I have another clip that helps explain this concept. Go right ahead. Wonderful. From the same Renegade Cut video as before, which I highly recommend watching and will have linked down in the description, they use the movie Conan to discuss how women are seen and used in toxic masculinity. And the last thing Conan says? Here are the lamentations of the women. Okay, so let's talk about that. 
Conan, encountering women, mindlessly calls them sluts. In another scene, Conan is gifted a woman who clearly does not want to have sex with Conan. Toxic masculinity tells men that they should be prepared for sex at any time, and that it is only natural to believe oneself entitled to the attention of women. The toxic script says that if men think about sex all the time, then that is the natural course they must take, and that men therefore must be extremely forward about sex. That sex is an inevitability, mandatory, and can skirt around the borders of consent. You can imagine how women feel about this sexual aggression, especially when it is justified as boys will be boys. Especially when it is justified as boys will be boys. Thank you. Boys Will Be Boys is a huge part of how Shane Dawson and David Dobrik created spaces where their terrible actions went unquestioned for so long. Not by directly saying, oh, boys will be boys or anything like that, but that same attitude of, oh, it's just a joke. Oh, don't take it seriously. Oh, it's just having a good time. Oh, we're just friends, whatever. That is what I mean when I say that boys will be boys is a big part of how they justified their actions and presented their actions as a way that it was non-offensive to the majority of people for such a long time. And they did it by filling those spaces with people who were less powerful than them in the social hierarchy. They framed it as, it's just a joke. I'm the cool one, you can trust me. And then that brings us to the third key component, toughness. We've talked about power with they created a space where they were the powerful one despite the fact that in the typical gendered structure they would not be as powerful as some more typically hyper-masculine men. We've talked about anti-femininity and specifically using derogatory terms about female sexuality as constant jokes as well as more serious offenses against women and girls. And now toughness because neither of these guys appears particularly tough. Personally, I don't think either of these guys present themselves in a way that is that people would generally think of as toughness, but the way they spin it is they say, if you don't like me, you're just a hater. It doesn't affect me. They don't show emotion to their criticisms. Mostly, both of them have apologized for their actions here, but they tend to spin the narrative in a way that it's, if you don't support them, you're just a hater. It's on you. It doesn't affect them, which is a form of toughness. It's like, have thick skin, being a creator on YouTube, having thick skin and not letting it get to you, and oh, just ignore the haters, is their display of toughness. But by framing their critics as simply haters or people being too sensitive to off-color jokes, they are able to dismiss the criticism and belittle the criticism and not actually take the criticism seriously, which in turn influences their fans to not take the criticism seriously either, which again protects them and creates this bubble where they are untouchable. So with all of these mechanisms combined, by creating a space where they are the most powerful, despite the fact that they may not have been the most powerful in the typical hierarchy before YouTube by getting fame and money and fans and people to care about them, specifically people who are typically less powerful than they are. They created a space where they went unquestioned. They primarily female victims in sexual ways. And used the boys will be boys, it's just a joke, type of rhetoric to excuse these actions, these very anti-feminine, anti-female actions. And then any criticism, while they may have apologized, they also tended to spin the narrative, I'm the big powerful YouTuber that you guys are just jealous of, that you guys are just haters, whatever, whatever, to create this space where they did not get called out by the masses for a long period of time and had these long successful careers while hurting people in plain sight and didn't really face consequences until now, until we're all becoming more aware of toxic masculinity, of we have coming forward and sharing their stories, despite the fact that they are going up against people who are bigger, more trusted, more loved, more powerful than they are. And finally, in the court of public opinion, I think it is working to an extent. Shane Dawson 
hasn't been on the internet for a while and I'm kind of hoping he stays that way. He has had hints of a comeback, but he can just stay gone after everything he's done. David Dobrik, I think, needs to face criminal charges for his actions, for being complicit and assisting in a crime. I don't think that's gonna happen, but hopefully this will have a real damage to his career, have real consequences that he has to face for what he did to this girl. And his history of horrible sexist, racist behavior. And even though these men are not typically who we think of as perpetuating toxic masculinity. We have the stereotype of the big buff dude who just uses women and doesn't care about them and, and never cries and tells other men not to cry and is kind of a bully towards more feminine-like men than he is. That doesn't mean that the less hyper-masculine, less typically stereotypically masculine men don't perpetuate the same stereotypes, the same pattern, the same toxic masculinity, if given the opportunity. It doesn't necessarily mean men have to. There's definitely men out there who are wonderful, who want to learn, who want to get better, who want to stand by women and move our society forward because toxic masculinity doesn't just hurt women, it hurts men as well. But it is difficult to unlearn something that has been so ingrained into you. And luckily I do think things are changing in general, but it's a slow process. And when these patterns come up again, even in people we don't expect them to, it's still important to call them out and say, this is still that same problem, just packaged a little differently. So like I said, if you want to know more about the specific situations, the specific allegations, the what rather than the how, I will have videos that I found very informative linked down in the description. I hope I have done the situation justice. I am just one person trying to do my best. If I got anything wrong in this video, please let me know. Please let me know your opinions. If you agree, if you disagree, this video is meant to be a start of a discussion. Definitely not the end all be all of this is what's going on. I just really wanted to talk about this and analyze it. So please let me know all your thoughts. Thank you so, so much for watching and I will see you all next time.